الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وبعد الحمد لله although we'd recited up to ayah 23 of surah an-nisa we only were able to reach the tafsir of the 19th ayah now it is significant because there are a number of things that are stated here and one of them that we will cover is the necessary relations between uh, the mahram and non-mahram the relations between mother-in-law and their in-laws Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has discussed this matter in great detail so what we will have to do is to take our time going through these and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, his success in this regard. Imam ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, he says, quote, Now the exalted one, when he has mentioned the ayah, and if you make up your mind to replace or change one wife for another, and you've already given her a qintar, a heap of treasure, then do not take anything back of it. How would you take this back? There was this wealth that you've gifted and have done this and you have done so in open sin. And how can you claim back the valuables that you gave as gifts when you have mixed with each other and you've taken a solemn covenant? And do not marry those women who your fathers and forefathers before had married, except what has already passed. Indeed, that was a perverted and despicable act in an evil way. Surah An-Nisa, the fourth surah, ayat 20 through 22. When the exalted one says, if you so desire to replace a wife, this ayah is speaking to the men. And the spouse in question, because the word zawj is used, which can mean husband or wife, but in this case it means spouse. And the word spouse is referring to the woman. Now we've already discussed the meaning of the word qintar in Surah Ali Imran. So we shall not cover that again. But the ayah is discussing the men replacing one wife with another. Allah says, do not take anything from it. Now, this is talking about the case of the one who has had the sexual intercourse with the wife. He's been alone with her. And this matter will become more clear as we move to the next ayah. Al-Qadibu Ya'la, the elder, has said, the prohibition has been given from taking anything from what was given at the time of taking another wife in place of the other. But this ayah's warning is also general. And no one should think that it is valid to do so in other than this case. Because the matter returns to something in which the woman has been given something that is her property. Now, in the case that a woman should forego the bridal gift then her right would come away and she would forego the right of the bridal gift. Secondly, the bridal gift is still hers and her right and it is established in place of it. When the exalted one calls this a great thing to do, a clear sin by taking it, what is meant is that it is oppression as stated by Ibn Abbas and Ibn Qutaybah. Secondly, it also means that it is oppression and falsehood, as mentioned by Az-Zujaj. So don't take back things that you should not take back because this would be sinful, it would be false, and it would be oppression. And then the exalted one, he says, and how could you take a portion of it back? How could you make taking some of the bridal gift permissible how could you do such a thing 
while you have already gone in unto one another. This is referring to two things. One, it is referring to the going in unto one another is referring to sexual intercourse. As is said by Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, as Sudai, Muqatil, and Ibn Qutayba. Secondly, it's also referring to khalwa, being in seclusion with the woman, even if sexual intercourse did not result. Now, the intent of the expression, a solemn covenant, when Allah says, and you've taken, they have taken from you a solemn covenant, it's said of the women that how could you take back some of the bridal gift when you've gone in unto one another and they, meaning the women, took from you a solemn covenant? The solemn covenant in reference here is of three things. One is the covenant which Allah took for the women over the men in which they would hold them in marriage with righteousness or if divorce was to occur, they would release them in goodness. This is the statement of Ibn Abbas, Al-Hasan, Muhammad ibn Sirin, Qatada, Al-Dahak, Al-Sudayy, and Muqatil. <coughs> Secondly, it's referring to the actual sacrament of the marriage. As mentioned by Mujahid and Ibn Zaid. And thirdly, it is discussing the trust that Allah has taken with regards to the covenant of marriage. And this is the reality of the matter, as mentioned by Ar Rabia. Close quote. Now, this statement is referring to a number of things. As said before in the ayah, marriage, the word nikah in Arabic can have two meanings. The linguistic sense of the word, which is presented in Ayah 22 of Surah An-Nisa that is coming. But there is also the second sense of the word, which means the sacramental act of marriage. So when it says that the women, they took from you a solemn covenant, mithaqan ghalidha, a solemn covenant, Part of what's being referred to is the marriage and divorce, the, pos the prospect that they have to be kept in righteousness or released in goodness, but also the actual uqdun nikah or the aqdun nikah, that in and of itself is a solemn covenant. It is a sanctified affair. So when someone, when people are looking to get married, when they get married, it's not merely that they're doing so because, well, I finished university and that's it now or I've got nothing better to do, or I'm having pressure put on me. Part of what the marriage is, is a sanctified, holy affair that Allah says is a solemn covenant. It is a covenant. So it's not a light matter. And it would be better for us as Muslims to understand more about this so that we do not make the mistake of taking marriage lightly because it is a severe matter. So serious that Allah called it غليظة, a severe, a severe, a right covenant. A severe covenant. Now Imam al-Jawzi rahimahullah, he then brings us to the next point. He says, quote, and the exalted one says, and do not marry those women who your fathers had sexual intercourse with before, except what has passed. 
Ibn Abbas radiallahu an mentioned that in the times of Jahiliyyah, what would happen is they, the people would not hold to what Allah had made haram except the case of the woman who was the wife of the father and marriage between two sisters. And this ayah was sent down. One of the Ansar had also said that Abu Qais ibn al-Aslat had died. And his son ibn Qais married his wife. And she came to the Prophet wasallam and asked permission and said, I had only had a child before. What shall we do with regards to this matter? And so this ayah was sent down. It's also been mentioned that the word nikah being used here in this ayah is referring to the sexual intercourse. And it is built upon a number of issues. al qadabu Ya'la has said that by this, by the word nikah, being used to refer to marriage and sexual intercourse, Allah is making the link here that sexual intercourse should only occur within the boundaries of marriage. For both words are synonymous. And when the exalted one is said, and when you have married the believing women, then you divorce them before you touch them. Surah the Hazad, the 33rd Surah 49 this is saying, actually, when you have had sexual intercourse with the believing women, then you divorce them. But we know that in this ayah, the sense is when you have contracted the marriage. So at times, the word nikah, based upon the context, can refer to the contracting of the marriage, the sacramental aspect of the marriage, or sexual intercourse. And that they were told that they are not to marry the women who their fathers had been married to, except what had already been passed. This is referring to a number of issues. Firstly, what is passed means that Allah has overlooked what had happened in the past. And now that the ayah is revealed, it must be followed. So, do not marry the women that your fathers had married because you will be punished for doing so. Except what has happened before. Because Allah has already nullified this matter. And you shall not be asked about what was before. For this was before the revelation. So it means whatever had come in the past. And whatever had happened before, you should leave it and not repeat it. Because it was a perversion. And so when you're told, do not marry the women whom your fathers married before. So just as you had done this in the past and it caused corruption and perversion, such a thing is not permissible in Islam. What has already passed in your jahiliya is finished now. And no one may begin this again in Islam. So, Allah is telling you, do not do what you had done in the past. Do not return to this, for it is not allowable for you to do. And when you're being told this, 
It doesn't mean that what was done before was permitted. It means that what was done before is now past. The fornication and the things that have been done before are now past. And you will not be called to account for that which was past. And doing this is corruption and evil and the most despicable way. So the one who marries the woman that his father had married and lays with such a woman, such a matter is despicable and impermissible and is not valid. You should know that this has been made impermissible. And that this impermissible thing should be something hated in their hearts for all times. Allah has declared that it's compulsory for them to hate that which they have done of the past. And this is an evil way indeed. This should not be done. Close quote. Now, this statement, the men whom the fathers had married... There are a couple of points that need to be kept in mind. There is a hadith in the Sunan of Imam al-Nasai in which a man saw one of the companions walking with the standard of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was walking and he was stopped. He was asked, why are you carrying this standard? And he said, I am carrying this standard because I am going to execute a man. And he was asked, why... And for what is the man being executed? He said, the man is being executed because he has married and slept with his father's wife. And the man was killed. This hadith is in the collection of Imam al-Nasai and is also mentioned in the collection of Sa'id. Why is this significant? Here is why. And part, and it's tied to Ayah 23, which we'll come, we'll come to in just a moment. Once a man marries a wife, the mother of the wife becomes a mahram to him. It's what is called in the revealed law, and in this, the ayah that's coming next, what is called the rabiba, the mother-in-law. Now, the mother-in-law because he has contracted this marriage with the wife, that mother-in-law becomes a mahram to him. So the same way that this man would look upon his mother, his natural mother, is the same way that he is allowed to look upon this woman who is his naturalized mother he becomes her mahram permanently. Permanently. Even if a divorce should result, according to a hadith in the Sunnah of Imam Nasa'i, the Muslim of Imam Ahmed and others, she remains his mother-in-law. This is something that cannot be changed. This cannot be done. It is a permanent state. The Rabiba does not lose her state. So if he marries her daughter and the situation comes where she needs to go on Hajj, he is every bit as much a naturalized mahram as the rest. He is a naturalized mahram. And you'll find within the ayah that's coming next the prohibition upon marrying your Rabiba, your mother-in-law, because of the fact that they have become naturalized. So you have the naturalized mahram, you have the mahram by lineage, and then you have the mahram by milk fostering. The mahram by naturalization is in this particular case. 
The mahram by lineage is obviously talking about sisters, aunts, great aunts, grandmothers. They are by lineage haram to marry. Those who have fed from the same breast milk, three feedings and more. It is impermissible for them to marry because they are milk brothers and sisters. <laughs>